ESP.bet. Watch and bet live. Okay, I'm here for another episode of Talk to Thorin, and my guest for this one is going to be Sue Joy, former Quake professional, Quake 3 as well, and now director of esports at Lockbox. So, Sue Joy, one of the reasons I wanted to do an episode of this with you is as esports has gotten bigger, one of the main I mean, I would say driving factors, one of the main things that people aspire to is to court and to hopefully increase media attention, ideally within that to bring a positive light to esports or to just sell people on the idea of, you know, basic things like what's cool about esports, what it's like even, you know, these are all things that sound very simple on the surface, but as soon as you have a conversation with someone who doesn't know anything about the topic, you find out, you know, you sometimes you have to explain things that you thought... Like, I mean, the amount of times I've told someone something like, oh, I was at a tournament, and they'll be like, so anyone could play it, and you're like, I've told you this a million times. No, it's a professional <laughs> tournament, you know, they're all pro players. Like, it's not it's not like a lottery, you know. They, they are, you know. So the point is, it's it, it's a trickier than people might think. There's a lot of nuance to it. And for people who don't know, even though in the days when you were starting to compete in Quake World and then the early days of Quake 3, so we're talking like late 90s into early 2000s, Yes, esports itself hadn't gotten anywhere near to the media attention it had now. But for people who don't know this, so at the time, the idea of media obligations for a pro player were almost non-existent. There were even some amazing players who barely ever did an interview, who never did, even with press and journalism, you know, there would just be a few esports journalists who were doing these things. Mm -hmm. But you were notable in the early days. I think you and Fatality were the main two guys, I remember, who not only were able to do interviews and, and promote yourselves, but clearly had some sort of an aptitude for it, excelled in it, <laughs> understood the world. And for people who don't know, you have a background where you, before you made the, the hard switch into being a pro in Quake 3, you were working as something, what was it, an investment banker or something? Some uh, sort of financial was, job? Yeah, merchant banking from Wall Street to pro gaming. Okay, so I'm getting a, <laughs> I'm getting a sense. Was this part of um, why you had a, kind of a better feel for media and the, and the importance of it because as i say there was a lot of really good players back then who it probably never crossed their mind they might be able to get sponsorships or get invited to tournaments whatever it might be if they did this sort of thing yeah uh well yeah nice to talk to you duncan that was a nice intro thank you very kind and generous uh i think when i think back about um the early days of pro gaming i don't think i'm not sure we can call it pro gaming it's such a different beast um back from 99, 2000 to what we got today. But it it was completely different. And I was always accused of being like a, a self-publicist, a media yes. whore. <laughs> and, uh, the same thing was leveled at a fatality, though, to be yeah, fair as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah, it hurts sometimes, you know, it's it, it was tough because it, it's easy to criticize people that are in the public eye, obviously. But um, you had to have a thick skin because not just for the, for the reaction you get within the gaming community, but going on to the media back in those days was, I'd like to say completely different in the, in that they all thought we were a joke anyway. They, they yes. probably still do that to some extent, but um, it was a different beast back then because see my story and, I, and you, you know, the way you put it was right. It was my novelty story that got the headlines because whenever you want to get on the media, it's about a narrative. It's what's what's the hook? Yes. Um, and this is what any journalist is after. They want this like really crystal. If you crystallize their story, whatever the piece is, it's one line of something that really grabs your attention. Um, and for my case, it's um, well, it's either Wall Street banker gives it up to become a pro gamer. And the implication that, being that is a pretty good hook. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I used it. <laughs> of course I did. But the, the the implication there is that when you say pro gamer, it's like, well, that's ridiculous. What does that mean? And so the implication of saying Wall Street gamer to pro Wall Street <laughs> from Wall Street to pro gamer, the implication is that there must be serious something serious about pro gaming. And you're right. I think there was very few people doing that. And uh, despite oh god, I got called so many things and. Um, I just had the the piss ripped out of me for for everything I did. I, I remember doing tabloids where 
the photographer from the photographer from the Daily Mirror would, would come in and just make you do stupid things, like stupid things. I've heard yeah, people from the Olympics, Olympians are having to bite their their, their gold medals and right, things yes. like that. Yeah, being like hectored by this photographer. Bite the medal, bite the medal, bite the fucking medal. <laughs> um, sorry, am I allowed to swear? Yeah, don't, don't, I, I do it myself all the time, man. Don't all worry. Right. I won't worry then. Well, okay, on this line then, as you were saying there, mm. like what was different about how the current media attention is, is if you notice, because a lot of, and unless they're doing a negative story, the current trend of how they tend to present uh, esports in the mainstream media is because they know big companies are investing. Now it's more like, here, here is a new sport, okay? Here are all these people who maybe vaguely have heard of it. You know, this is the ne next big thing, and here's why you should care. You know, this company's invested, this sports team's invested. So now they do treat it a bit more seriously. But as you were saying, like, the main angle they used to take, I mean, I'm, I'm remembering off the top of my head when I think you went on, like, the Big Breakfast or something. Oh, God. The, obviously, <laughs> the approach they used to take to everything that went on that show was, like, here's a, here's a zany novelty thing, you know? So the idea was wacky of, like, wow, really? Do they, what, they have competitions, you know? And, it, and mm. they kind of treated year and everyone in gaming like which to some degree we were to be fair like we were sort of the what i mean this shows how dated my references because i was going to say a comic book fan but obviously <laughs> everyone's a comic book fan yeah i'm thinking yeah. of the anorak and you know yeah. the guy who goes to the conventions that's kind of how they saw it right and that you had to overcome that to some degree yeah and the first the very first live tv i did was the big breakfast which for for non-uk people who lived during the 90s um it's it's this it's a breakfast show where it's kind of zany and wacky and Johnny Vaughan's on the show doing a piece called, I can't believe they get paid for that. Just ripping okay. into me. Like absolutely ripping into me. It was like that. And this is me on live TV for the first time. And I'm, I'm not the most extroverted person in the world by a long shot. So I, I'm just getting ripped to pieces by Johnny Vaughan basically on live TV saying, Oh my God, you get paid to do that. What's wrong with you? And, uh, <laughs> It, it was, um, yeah, it was challenging, but uh, the the narrative has changed now. Obviously, like everyone yes. knows, games huge. Like they they can't say games is some kind of ridiculous industry which doesn't matter anymore. And gaming icons are huge. Nobody, you can't say they're not um, they're they're not significant. So it's a lot it's a lot different now. But I suppose, yeah, I mean, we're going back to what you were saying was like no one else realized how important it was to get your name out and like if i'm honest i don't think i was the best player in the world i was probably a good publicist though because i i used i used the attention i got to get more coverage more coverage meant uh it snowballs and when it when that happens i can get sponsors and when i can get sponsors i can do things with that and i can build a business off that and i can i can uh, i can actually make a career from it and that that's what pro gaming used to be it wasn't about being the best player it was about can you make something of being a good player sure okay <laughs> what about this then since you said there that you know like you were describing this scenario where you were pretty much like baptism of fire for your first interview because it's not even just an interview they're trying to sort of be a little bit bawdy and take the piss out of you a bit you know yeah. and present you as ridiculous about yeah. what you're saying and so that is kind of the premise of the show what about this then? Since you said you didn't think you were that extroverted, hmm. like, I can understand why you would say that, but if people realized the, the context of the time, the people who were the pro players, they were nerds. That was, they were, by oh, definition, absolutely. they were nerds. I mean, I've always said this. I myself am a nerd. Obviously, I am super into the same games from 15 years ago. That I don't really know how much more nerdy you could get in that respect. So <laughs> in the context of the crowd you are in, though, isn't this to some degree also part of why other people didn't really see it as something viable? You know, they, they weren't really used to that social component as it, as though it were. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this was a different time. I, I don't know. It's, it's really hard to comprehend what life was like because there was no YouTube, let alone live streaming. Yes. Um, but th this is, you know, it was hard to build communities like we have now. Now you can live your entire life online and you can find friends uh, who have similar interests, but yeah, back then being a gamer was what made you a social outcast. And and I, I it was a bit tongue-in-cheek tongue, in, tongue in cheek when I was saying I wasn't an extrovert. I was a total introvert. Um, you had to be to be able to play games, to want sure. to play games anyway. Um, yeah, it, 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 was, it was a different time. Um, 
Where were we going with this? I've forgotten. Well, okay, how about this then? But at the same time, you say you're a total introvert, but you've always seemed very at ease on camera whenever I've seen you. And, and as I say, whenever you would be part of some kind of a newspaper piece, the quote they always got from you seemed very good. And you and like, like actually that angle you said about how you thought up the like stressing the banker to pro gamer mm. aspect, you know, this that's obviously a really great line because the, it kind of forces someone to take you seriously, right? If the, if you really did switch from, they know you must make a lot of money if you work on Wall Street or wherever it was you were. I think it was in New York, right? You were doing it. Yeah, I was I was in New York, Wall Street at J.P. Morgan. Um, great so there must job. Have been something about it. You had an aptitude, right? It was. Did you learn to enjoy it? Did you kind of? How, how were you so poised? How did you have such kind of composure? I, I think you're giving me too much credit. I think if you look back at some of my videos, you, you'll cringe okay. yourself. But I I worked at it, right? I, I wanted to make this a career. And I think that's probably what set me apart from many other people is that I put a lot of effort into making this work as a business, as a pro gamer. Um, and in terms of an industry that didn't exist, you know, there's no... There was no regular tournament structure to take part in. There was no um, there was no live stream channel. You just launch and get viewers on. You you had to create these things. You had to help make these things successful. Um, today, you know, if you're a pro gamer, you've got an infrastructure. You've got the whole thing in place. This path to go from getting good at games to becoming um, sponsored to joining a team to taking part in big tournaments and and making it big. It, there's a path laid out for you. Uh, this this I had to work for. So I did media media training. I thought about what they wanted. It, it took a hell of a lot of effort. When you were in, as you said there, where maybe you weren't the best player, and obviously, I, I, I mean, I can see what you're remembering here is that at the time, since everyone was a super nerd and they didn't understand even what the point of doing media stuff was, mm. people did just paint it as, oh, you're just doing it for well i would assume narcissistic reasons what they try to imply right you know you're just doing it because you want to be in the paper or on television even though as you're saying if someone actually <laughs> understood some of the business concepts this is quite a key concept to getting sponsors to come along to show that you know i'm going to be in media more if you sponsor me and also my face is going to be out there and i'm going to be one of the one of the names that people associate with your product and with gaming in this kind of a world did it take a toll on being an actual pro in terms of being good at the game? Like, did you have to balance that? Because obviously the thing with the guy who doesn't do it is, yes, mm -hmm. he's going to miss out on all his opportunities, but at the time especially, he could just be in his in his room 14 hours in a, in a 1v1 server somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. It, I, I wanted to make this into a career. Obviously, I'd, I'd quit a great career, so I didn't want to screw up too badly because <laughs> I'll just forever regret trying to become a pro gamer if that happened. Um, yeah, it, it took a lot of time to to do these things i was i was constantly doing interviews you wouldn't believe i it took hours out of my day i think there was one year where i was doing two or three tv shows a day and um a, a week sorry and then radio and then newspaper and magazine articles just constant churn of this stuff and at the same time i was building my esports portal because th there wasn't much to re to be reported on otherwise yes. um you know, uh, working with writers, trying to get content onto the site, trying to get advertising deals. Um, it was a bit of a one man show sometimes. Um, but, you know, it, it took its toll on, you know, actually getting to play because that's what I started it for, you know, because I used to play 10, 12 hours a day of Quake because I just loved it so much. And then, you know, pretty quickly it goes down to two or three hours and you're still trying to be a pro gamer. I mean, how am I going to compete with with the, the kids who just play? Uh, yeah, it was hard. It was hard, but I don't regret it. Like, I think the industry as it is now is, is because of a lot of the things we did back then. Um, a lot of people who were just so passionate about esports, they they put their lives into it and shaped the direction it went in. I think those early days were were kind of instrumental in in how in whether the industry succeeded at all. As you say there, obviously in terms of um, creating your own media portal community in what was excess reality still yep. yes reality now obviously people will know quake etc the community still exists there to some degree it's obviously a fairly dilapidated scene but <laughs> yes it still does exist 
In fact, actually, the, what's funny is I imagine because there's just so many more people in gaming, even if it's very, very niche, it might even have more users now than it ever did. It's got, it's got to be somewhere up there, right? Uh, I, you know what? I haven't even been on it myself. I pay the server costs. Um, there's a lot of people. It's, it's surprisingly large, actually. It's it's just a trolling site now. Yes. I, I think the people on there don't even play Quake anymore, actually. Um, but uh, actually, you know, going back to another thing you said about the the commercials of of what it is to be a pro gamer. Um, I mean, times were different then, but. Yeah, you know, I don't think anyone really understood what it meant it, to most people who just play games. It's just magic money that appears. It's it's a case of um, we'll get this label, um, we'll get this sponsor, and magic money appears. And it, it's actually, I think, I think one thing that a lot of gamers fail to appreciate is how this business actually works. What what drives it? Where, where's the value? Um, particularly in running events it, it's a tough business I, i've run yes. a few events um making making your books balance is not easy you, know, you can fill up a venue with people and it, that doesn't mean you're going to be successful it, it's a really tough business still today i think to be successful in, in running tournaments yeah, abso oh, absolutely. I mean, this is this is one of those things where I'm sad to inform you that even the current crop of pro gamers mm. hasn't really sort of like evolved their mentality to really understand the business too much because obviously their team now takes care of all the sponsorships and stuff, you know. So there's a lot of really good players in games like Counter-Strike and League of Legends who legitimately think that they're going to get paid big money because of how well they did in the game. Whereas mm. I've, I've sometimes, some of them are friends of mine. I'll just explain it to them like this. I just say, but how could the sponsor have known how good you'd be now a year ago when he got that deal mm. to get you this money? Like it doesn't, you know, clearly there was a talent there that your team, which essentially the teams kind of are like agents at this point in time until we get to a, a bigger level where everyone has an individual agent. Mm. Yeah, this is, this is something that to this day is still a disconnect, mate, believe it. I mean, we've got other people to do it, so it's kind of getting taken care of. But I still feel like this is one of those areas where, players the ones that get on board with this will be the ones who become the multi multi millionaires you know because if you think about professional sports yeah. they've moved beyond where we are in esports you know you can have an individual brand you can have a shoe brand just for you and a team that doesn't have to be your whole team getting sponsored by whoever it might be reebok or adidas or something and so it feels like as mm. much as this was a conversation about the past of esports, this is going to be the future of esports as well right is people actually have to kind of learn how to self-publicize yeah, uh, and we've definitely not we've not hit the end game of, of this yet. It, the thing is, though, it's all changing, isn't it? it? It's not linear TV anymore. This is interactive, engaging media all the time, and it's it's people doing live streams. It's and it's I don't know what it's going to look like in the end, but I think there's so much more that can be done in, in terms of where's the value in this. And and my you know I used to I was working at ESL before so I can I can talk about how hard it is to run an event now and and make money on that and you know all the the flack they get for for changing platform to to Facebook yes but yeah I don't know you kind of need to step back and say okay but how do you make money from this event if <laughs> and if if that's one way I mean I actually don't know the commercials of that myself but I imagine it's it's a financial decision um, as far as i know the big problem and this is the funny detail <laughs> because unfortunately this is where fans don't realize that they're not really being like consistent because the problem is the tournament organizers are kind of getting pinched from both sides so on the mm. one hand a way that they could go where they wouldn't need to do broadcast right deals would be to just have the fan pay. It would be a pay-per-view experience. Now, obviously, <laughs> the fan doesn't want to pay. I mean, why yep. would he? It's free right now. So then you go, okay, you're not going to pay. Okay, right, I've got to get someone else to pay. So, okay, I can get someone to pay a bit more if we go to this other broadcasting platform. And then, of course, the fan's like, well, I prefer the other one. I want it to mm. be on it. It's like... Well, someone's got to pay, guys. Otherwise, well, or, or we can just go back in time and it can be, you know, $50,000 for the whole event and we're all Do you remember doing the days? it two times a year. Do you remember the days? I, I don't know, back back in CPL days, you had to pay to enter a tournament. Yes, <laughs> the that players was part of their funded. model, yeah. That's yes, how they did it. Yeah, because yeah. Like, there was no money, right? And, and imagine going back to those days, not even the viewers having to pay, the players have to pay to take part as well. 
uh, yeah, we, we've come a hell of a long way. And, and honestly, we've got it so good right now that I cringe a little bit at some of the complaints. Now, now I get, I get, you know, we want to go forward and not backwards. And it, and sure. it hurts when, when an experience is not as good as it was last time. Um, Absolutely. But it, it's, it's a tough business and, and you have to appreciate where's the money coming from. Um, yeah. And I, I do think that the players who are on their toes and, and make themselves commercially viable, I don't, see, I, I, I split on this as well. I don't think commercially viable just means being super clean, uh, family friendly and, you know, just doing all this. It's about personality as well. And it's sometimes hard to get personality across. And, you know, it, uh, I kind of want to see more of that in pro gaming. Well, that's also, de it's because, like, understandably, I mean, this is what they obviously did in American culture. Like, it's the easiest way to sell someone is, you know, boy next door, clean cut, quarterback. Mm. That, you know, that's obviously the, the script that we all know very well. But you're definitely right. I mean, you just have to look at something like professional wrestling. You can sell a villain as well. You can sell the guy who's the trash talk. Obviously, this is where, to tie back into your day, if someone like Machiavelli had taken some of the approach of fatality, he didn't have to go full out as, as much as fatality <laughs> did, but even just a bit of it, again, he could have probably made his own career more stable, could have made himself in a better position, right? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the reason why people don't play as much, back, or certainly back then, was because it wasn't that financially viable at the time. So, so yeah, yeah. Machiavelli was like a great player. I, I like Victor a lot. Um, he, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I love those stories. You, you remember back then it was the story of him like picking up a chair and throwing across the room because yes. he lost a game. Like, those are great stories. And that's kind of cool in a way, right? <laughs> yeah. and, and this is in a time when, you know, these people are very like low key playing games and that, that was unheard of. So, you know, that that made like a viral story back in the days before Twitter. Um, so, yeah, you're right. If if there was a way to, to sell that, I, I do kind of think, though, it was still too risky back then for for big companies to jump in. And it, and it was endemic people. You know, I was sponsored by people like Razer and yes. platforms and, um, the, you know, uh, platforms, ISPs to play games on. It, you know, to sell a bad boy of gaming then, I, I, I'm not quite sure you'd have got that much. You, you'd have got someone to stretch to that. But today, absolutely. Um, but I, I, I mean, here's the thing. Now, now the tournament organizers are are getting strict on on everyone should be super yes. professional, and that yes. I, I really hate that. <laughs> I, think, I think it's horrible. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, like for, like my perspective on that is again they've just made the mistake of kind of what we just touched on, which is like, mm. yes, that has been a very successful way to market people is like, hey, this is very safe for everyone. And don't worry if your kids watch this, you know, we sort of keep it clean. That's clearly a, a great way to reach a certain demographic. Mm. But I always tell people this, my analogy, I always try to give them is, and this is why I think it's good that there's different esports titles, because you know what, if League of Legends wants to be like that, and Overwatch wants to be like that, cool. Those are probably the right games to do that. Those are more suited. Yeah. But if you're going to get like CSGO, and dota you should go like the mma route you should be like this these are the guys who are like they're pretty hardcore guys they're gonna trash talk you know we're gonna show off some flair and then the, you know you're gonna try and get what in our days was like kind of the it was the same audience that the playstation targeted you know the idea was it was someone who was an adult it wasn't supposed to be the the 12 year old kid it was the 21 year old who has a bit of disposable income and it's supposed to be cool to do it isn't it? it's not supposed to be just fun yeah yeah uh I mean, you pick two Valve games there, and Valve, like, uh, at least probably um, are more relaxed in their view of, of the things that happen, yes. I suppose. Um, but it, it comes down, comes back to commercials, doesn't it? Because the two you pick that saying that they have to be clean are the two that are run by the publisher. Yes. Um, who have such a vested interest in the way their their tournament runs. So, so yeah, I mean, I think it's quite telling, isn't it? It's... It, it does come back to commercials and here the the number one the person in charge of everything is thinking about how does my game look uh, how is this portraying my game as well um 
So yeah, I, I think it. I think it always tells. Like it, you always follow the money, and you you figure out who's in charge. Absolutely yes. So when when you said you built up this media portal, you made this website, right? How much of that in the early days was just kind of like, just let's just see if it works and see if we can do this. Let's see what it's like. How much did you understand that, for example, there needs to be a place that everyone can go? And actually, one of the key things about your website in the early days was. Mm -hmm it looked a lot better than most of the other ones. Like it, <laughs> the days we're talking about, you had a lot of very, very simple HTML websites, whereas this had like nice graphics, like the section looked good, it had a design. Like mm. I forget, who did you actually get to design it? It looked like pretty cool, right? Uh, yeah, there's a guy, oh God, you, you, you know we're going back 18 years now. Is right? someone famous? Uh, it, was, it was the guy who was working for CPL, Sean something. Uh, ah, I, okay. I've totally forgotten his name, but... Okay. He, he was actually working on other um, esports, we'll, we'll say esports, <laughs> but but games titles. And um, yeah, he was brilliant. He had this sort of tattoo design. Uh, we had it running through the whole site. And you know, we even had um, making the site was BDS, who was like a legend in Counter Strike. Absolutely, yes. Um, who <laughs> and this is weird. Quake Three was the big game at the time. BDS, who was you know, we're talking top. Yeah, Geek Boys was like one of the top teams. Yes. He was desperately asking us to teach him how to play Quake because that was the game that mattered then. Yeah. Little, well, of course, you know, a few years later on, it switched places. Counter Strike was just way bigger than Quake, but, but, yeah, we we had a great team. And did they do it on purpose? No, I, I mean, some of it was a case of we we need to raise sponsorship money right that's that's great but how how do we get coverage for this well we don't have any great media portals to be on so we'd better make a media portal as well and it it turned into a package of pro gaming plus the media portal um and it and it made sense but i think it was more of a happy coincidence as like fully planned out i'm not going to give myself that much credit um it it just it at the time, you know, websites were, were really valuable as well. And we were trying to build this portfolio of um, of a company that could be valuable and be sold. Of course, this was just before the dot-com bubble burst. So yes. yes. Well, that's actually a topic I wanted to move on to because, again, something that might surprise people. This is something I often tell people in the modern day to show that, yes, esports definitely grew, mm. but it wasn't just – it wasn't like a straight line just going up the whole way because, obviously, we had the dot-com bubble burst in your day and then oh. halfway through – it was about like 2008 or so, we had, obviously, that whole global – banking crisis which just affected everything and then even though yep. it wasn't directly esports the, the bottom dollar of esports went down you know these were kind of things that like didn't reset everyone completely but they put you back a little bit and you have to sort of you have to make mm. up that distance again and go past so the reason why this is significant is because in the very early days before the dot-com bubble burst actually some things were at a much much higher level than than they were for years later like for example the mm. money you could get for banners on websites or the sponsorships you could get from some of these peripheral companies they were they were actually at a much higher level than after the bot the bubble burst may i think it maybe took half a decade yeah. to get close to that again right so well, you're talking big numbers yeah i, I obviously I, that was part of the reason of of making a, a media portal for for esports was was the banner ads we were getting ridiculous we were getting like 20 dollars cpm on banner ads on impressions not even clicks for a while that's pretty insane, isn't it? <laughs> that, it? It makes no sense whatsoever. I, I, I mean, a lot of it made no sense in a way. You know, Razor paying quarter of a million dollars sponsorship a year didn't make much sense either. Um, a lot of, I think, a lot of, um, a lot of deals at the time were just funded by this sort of crazy VC. It's like everybody quickly get into technology, um, just money flowing everywhere for for a short time um and you know then in those times you sold things off the strength of emotion and it was sure. a case of look this is cool new stuff kids playing games competitively people watching them uh the best in the world all coming to one place under one roof and this is like there's an emotional idea you're selling to sponsors which worked for a while um it all came crumbling down Back what was that round when the when the bubble burst, <laughs> advertising revenue disappeared. Um, Razor went bust. That was my biggest sponsor at the time. Um, 
and you could see why <laughs> it's like the amount of money that was being spent on events and and sponsorships sure. and prize money you know these, these the first esports tournaments where you'd hit um ten thousand dollars then fifty thousand dollars then a hundred thousand dollars and then we were getting million dollar tournaments it just grew like so quickly out of nowhere um but then died right <laughs> so what was it around 2001 2002 all of a sudden yes. dead nothing and then going back from this sort of crazy ride you sort of settle back down to people playing games just because they love playing them <laughs> and, and in a way i like those resets because sometimes you need the reset to sort of take stock and why are we doing this again well, actually, one of the things, funnily enough, this is something that Richard, Richard Lewis often says, is like the he, one thing that he thinks is good about when that happens hmm. is it kind of weeds out who was only there because they saw like there was loads of money coming in and it's getting bit, you know, that sort of a person is going to be the first person out the door when they find out what we're going back a few years. Yeah, I'll, I'll come back later. You know, like the people who really love it, they're going to stick around, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, I, and here's the thing. I, I ran out of money completely. I was living in um, L.A. for a while trying to keep excess reality going and we ran out of money um came back home tail between my legs and you know what i did i i sat and coded a new site for like a, a year or two and and started thinking okay maybe there's another way to do this maybe we can rebuild uh, these principles of, of what does a tournament look like and i started building stuff in the uk on a smaller scale that that slowly grew into into bigger businesses um and then we were talking about waves. The the next one, did did you? It was like the recession, two thousand and eight. Yes. I think it was around then. Yes. Yeah, because just before then we had CGS. And that um, was one of the things that killed CGS, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> it could be that, or it could have been just the flawed principle. <laughs> Probably both. Yeah, a little bit of both. But we we saw that right that you know a big company swoops in and says, "Let's do it this way." And and at the time we'd been waiting for for linear TV to jump on board, yes. right? Onto, onto esports and then it happens and we thought yes we're going but but the fact that that reset you know took linear tv out of the equation was probably the best thing that could have happened because without that we wouldn't have had um you know twitch make such a big splash and then for for more uh, organic organizations to grow and take that space when you said there about how when I mean, you quoted some of those crazy figures, which, I mean, people would realize now, like a few years ago, those would have been unthinkable numbers. You know, it's only now we're getting to that kind of level of sponsorship, et cetera, for individuals. Mm. When you, when you, because obviously at the time, the other thing is people didn't have agents, you know, they get, it's too small. So essentially, not only are you, you, you're your own publicist, you're also your own agent. Essentially, you have to figure out the deals, you have to negotiate things with mm -hmm. people, you have to manage all these things. When you would go to someone and you'd have a meeting with them, I mean, again, having someone who has a, a profile, so that certainly will help. Maybe it helps get your foot in the door. But what? Di how did you sell a deal there? How do you how do you convince the person? Because you know, nowadays they'd put together, you know, like a research document with all the stats on Twitch and these. You know, you, you've got a lot of numbers you can throw at people and, and yeah. fancy pie charts and stuff. But th th there wasn't really that sort of thing back then. So how did you how did you convince people? You know what? I'm oh sorry, it's a bit loud out here. I, I'm chuckling because. Someone's riding their bike outside. Very. Right? I'm chuckling at that because if I did it now, I'd know exactly how to shape it. You know, I'd know how, what kind of research to put, what kind of figures to put. How do you how do you demonstrate an ROI? Um, no, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, You're just blagging it. I well, I, I went there with what I thought was significant was right. media clippings, um, pieces from um, articles we'd written. Uh, pictures of events, video content, things like that. It's all emotional, though, you know. Uh, it, it was all wrong. I, I'm shocked we got anywhere. Um, but like I say, it was an emotional sell. It was an emotional sell of this is the next thing. This is what the cool kids are doing. Um, come and get involved. Um, like, I look back and I'm, I'm shocked we got anywhere, actually. But I don't think I did a terrible job. I think um, okay. I think I just because I'm experienced now in under, understanding what uh, what a marketing budget is actually meant to achieve. <laughs> I, if I had that knowledge, then it would have been a, I don't know, <laughs> maybe would have got a lot more money. 
Well, you say that, but the thing that I think is actually impressive, especially mm. with some of these numbers, is that one of the problems I myself actually had in, in my career in esports is when I would get like a better job opportunity and they would do the part where, you know, you negotiate the salary and the terms and stuff, mm. I would always make the mistake of thinking that nah, esports isn't that big. So I'd always quote numbers that I only found out later were like way too low. You know, I would always ask for something like, because I would ask for what I thought was good. Yeah. What I really needed to know is obviously a very simple business concept <laughs> is what would the other person be willing to pay and what how, what is their valuation of it? That's what you kind of need to know, right? It's not about what you're willing to accept as the worst way to negotiate in the world. Yeah, because if you're a pro gamer looking to get sponsors, you know, I'm, I'm happy to pay for play for free. You know, if you give me anything, I'm over the moon. Uh, of course, that's the wrong way to go into it. And and I think for, for you as well, you know, you were like, uh, I remember you writing on art on, um, on excess reality and so on, you didn't get any money for that. No. <laughs> yeah. So as soon as someone offers you something, it seems great, right? Yes. But yeah. Exactly. Uh, but you know, knowing the value of of that is is it is, is just impossible when when we love this stuff so much. That's the problem. Is I think it's hard to take it as a career sometimes when you're doing something you love and you feel so passionately about i think you just have to be uh, very um what's the word uh you have to be very cold about how you approach it and work out what the equivalents are i mean it's still it's still not perfect uh, I, I look around esports today and there's too much supply of people and not enough demand still which means prices get driven down and don't seem as valuable, especially in the entry level jobs. It, it's tough to get a job in esports, I think, still. Yes. Um, but yeah, it's. I think I think you shouldn't underestimate the value of what we're doing. And you know, one of the things I think we all look back on and think that that was pretty amazing what what we started. Absolutely. Does that mean then that when you were in these meetings, mm. did you have a confidence about yourself? Were you, were you a bit cheeky with what you were asking for? These sound like pretty pretty sick deals. Uh, yeah, I think I think I was cheeky, but not not because I knew what it was worth. Because you didn't. <laughs> I don't think I did. No, no. Right. I, I, I was probably still a naive kid at, to, to some extent, and I just thought, look, this is this is what other people are paying. This is what we should get. Um, and you know, the games industry was still huge. And, and you look at events like E3 where they're, they're spending millions of dollars on, on booths and, uh, it, it felt right to ask for these and, and seeing the growth, like I say, the CPL tournaments at the time were, were, you know, the prize money was going up exponentially. So it seemed right to ask for a lot. <laughs> Well, the funny thing is, when you say that, there is a logic to it. Because actually, I remember, I, I've, uh, let me think. I watched a documentary, right, that was about the famous Hollywood movie maker, Orson Welles. So mm -hmm. a classic, you know, old-time movie maker. And there's a story that's always told in any, like, biography or documentary about the guy that when he made, because Citizen Kane was literally his first movie. He'd come from the theater, and he makes this movie. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons, apparently, why it was so good is the guy who at the time was, like, the best cameraman or something in Hollywood, like, volunteered to be on the movie and said, like, I want to make this picture with you because I've heard like, you know, some sort of a visionary. And there's a, like a, a, a really funny nuance, which is apparently the camera guy went and because he knew Orson Welles had never made any movies, he told all the other people who are working on the movie, hmm. don't ever tell him that like, whatever he says can't be done. And so apparently, like the famous thing about Citizen Kane is it had all these shots and, you know, like things that were like like marvels of technology. And supposedly the reason those exist is because the camera guy purposely didn't let Orson Welles know what was done in Hollywood. So oh. Orson Welles would just naively say something like, hey, let's do a shot here where, you know, we zoom in from the top and it comes through a shadow and we see a guy in a mirror. And whereas normally you'd just tell the director, oh, that can't be done. No one's ever done that before. Because this guy was sort of telling him like, shh, like they were just the, the confidence of it, not right? knowing. Yeah. yeah, they were doing it. Isn't this kind of like the what the spirit of what was needed back then? You can't, almost had to not know that you could fail, right? Yeah, uh, th that's. I mean, I, I that I think that's on the nose. That's exactly what I like to think is is how people in esports approach problems. Is they take it from first principles because you know what they don't know any better. <laughs> Uh, but it, it is true to some extent. It, it's it's a case of we're not following a blueprint of of how to do a thing like 
um, you know, when we're talking about creating a show, the production around the show, we, you know, we don't look to sports all the time just to do that because you know what we just figure out what we like and what the audience likes and and, you know that's one of the great things about streaming on something like twitch is that you just it's all it's just democracy isn't it it's good shows will get watched more bad shows don't and then they it's survival of the fittest and you get this evolution that this rapid evolution of of how do you present stuff what's a cool way what what are fun features and and you you get all those tired tropes out of the way and and you sort of present things in a different way it's one of the the things i like most that that i see at small studios you know that that they do is just be creative and try things and i i think it would be a crying shame if we went back to blueprints that of how things are done on tv all the time um I, I like it and it feels like us it feels like the kind of things that we created is, is just as important as well yeah and one thing you touched on there actually that re- that definitely makes me think of the old days mm. is if i had to describe very simply like why it was compelling because as, as as people might know despite some of the numbers like the prize money started to get good mm. but nothing else had leveled up you know like yeah. the event you'd go to the hotels you'd be sharing with people the travel we we're all traveling the cheapest possible yeah. routes you could take and terrible flights etc you know booked at the last minute etc well one thing though is what kept everyone going was it, even the, even if you were hardcore into the scene, there was something about even the concept that you could have pro gamers in a scene and like coverage that was so cool that you wanted to believe it could be real. I, mean, I can actually remember specifically myself when I grew up in the 90s. There were all those movies in the mid '90s, like like the movie Hackers and obviously The Matrix and stuff. And the whole concept that made these movies cool was the idea that you know you could be like a nerd, but there was a culture for you. And obviously at the time there wasn't really. You were just you were just a bunch of disparate nerds. And so I remember getting a bit older and realizing oh, that was just a movie, wasn't it? There isn't like if you've ever seen your own hackers, they go into like cool like bars and stuff where all the cool hackers hang out and like oh there's the evil hacker or whatever. it's like. There's nothing like that in real life, but then esports came along and it kind of was like that, you know, like if you went to the playing fields when there was a, which was a very famous land cafe in London, when there was a qualifier going on, it was, it kind of had like a, a really compelling feel to the the atmosphere, right? Even though it didn't have any of the, <laughs> the, the sparkly flashing lights that we would imagine now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, there, there was, uh, it was, it was just, it was our thing and the fans would be hanging out with players, hanging out with journalists and saying what we wanted and getting drunk and, and having a good time. Um, and yeah, it, it, I mean, I, I don't know what to say about it. I kind of, I miss those days because we're becoming more professional in a way. I mean, it has to happen, but um, it, it was it was this just feeling of, of creating things ourselves. Do you worry about that, the idea? I mean, you've touched on it. I noticed it's mm. a theme a couple of times. The idea that as it gets bigger, the temptation is to think, right, well, let's do it like, for example, you know, like an NFL broadcast where you have to have a suit and tie and it's, hey, welcome to the, you know, and everything has to be very clean cut or it has to be scale it as much as possible and make it just, you know, everyone watches it as opposed to maybe a niche. Do, mm. do you worry about as that happens, like the compromise component? Yeah, I do. And I, I think what makes... A lot of this stuff really special is that is this is this feeling that it's it's ours it's our thing and and it, obviously that can't last forever um and w- one one uh, example i always i always think about is on a small twitch channel for example it's a completely different feel to a large twitch channel because you can engage and contribute to everything going on you're you're part of the show because you're you're watching it yes. um as the channel gets bigger you lose that because it's just impossible. Um, and then as we go to tournaments, it's becoming more and more just like a, a broadcast, like like it's linear. And, uh, you know, we, we're sort of going backwards the other way. And, I mean, I don't know where we'll end up, but I, I really feel like the, we shouldn't be looking at old standards of how things are broadcast to, to see where we're going in the future. Because I like that family feel, and that makes me feel a part of it. And there should be stuff we do with technology, whether engaging an audience and having people feel like they are part of this event that they're watching. And, you know, it's one of these problems that I think technology has to solve. 
I have to say that, I mean, this is like an opinion that you'll definitely be familiar with. One thing that I'm not as big a fan of as it's gotten bigger mm. is part of how people who are maybe a bit cynical, maybe realistic, have seen how you could make esports bigger is you try and sort of conflate it with gaming generally. And because gaming as just a general identity is it's absolutely ubiquitous. Everyone claims they played Mario when they were a kid and has a had a PlayStation and now have mm. a PS4 or whatever, you know. Like everyone now will say they're a general gamer, right? I get why it's it's a cool idea to kind of connect that guy to us and be like, oh we're not that far off, you know, we just play it competitively. <laughs> But especially if you came from like, obviously the Quake community was the worst for this ever. I say the worst in a in a, 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 a fond way, quite frankly. But part of it was about you wanting to be hardcore as fuck, right? It was about being like, <laughs> no, we're not like just the general, but we're not even like the casual players. We are the hardcore of the hardcore. <laughs> so in a way, you, you want to keep that feeling too, right? Yeah, and I used to, I used to hate this idea of being called a gamer sometimes because. I didn't play any other games. I played one game. That was it, right? Yes. Does that make me a gamer? No, that makes me a Quake player. <laughs> um, and uh, I guess, I guess what what we look at is is the platform that makes esports work is live streaming platform. They also uh, make other things work, like watching Fortnite, um, watching streamers with their audience doing an entertainment show yes. and none of these things are really esports. No. Um, and I, you know, you can imagine in, in the kind of work I do, um, in this, in this industry means actually educating what, telling people what esports is <laughs> and they generally don't understand it because they understand video games, but esports is almost nothing to do with the game. I don't think, people come to watch the game at all they're coming to watch the team and yes. the players and the personalities and how these guys are going to strategize to beat that team the game is just it's almost not important to, to some extent um i mean of course it is but but that's not why you're going to the to to a stadium and cheering for your team um yeah i i i don't know i i i don't like that it's being conflated sometimes um and the the truth is like like i say esports is commercially hard to to make viable <laughs> so you know certain companies will will use maybe who are in esports will use the halo of esports to sell other products yes um but that's that's because of the commercial reality and and i think this is this is something it, it's working out how do you make this work and and valve you know we're selling compendiums for dota 2 have, have shown like one thing it's like actually yeah the audience can contribute and when they do yes. it's massive yeah. um and, and it's something along those lines that's going to be the next sort of evolution of esports i think the actually one thing that you said there that i can definitely relate to because this used to be just as a journalist a real pet peeve of mine is when a new journalist would come in and they'd write their story about esports, or and at the time it would just be Quake or it'd be Doom or something, you know, it'd, mm. it'd be one game that wasn't esports. I always tell people, like, it should just be called Quake, mate. Like, <laughs> it was that we had to come up with a term later when there's more games. You know? <laughs> yeah. So when when they would write the get write the article, you could always tell the person who didn't really ever like pierce the veil and get get to any of the juice of it because they got stuck on the surface. Like they, the article would always start with like really flowery language about like running around a dungeon and yeah. hell spawns and shooting a lightning gun. And it's like, if you talk about that, I mean, the modern equivalent is the people who think that, you know, like Count Strike's a violent game because the theme <laughs> is terrorism. But yeah. I always tell people, I think it's a pretty good analogy. I say it may as well be a, a paintball game. Like when you play paintball, you don't think, ah, wow, it's almost like I shot that guy with a gun. You go, <laughs> no, that's how you score points. You shoot people and you yeah. you can immediately see that the the theme doesn't really matter. It's it's sporting in the sense of you, that's how I score a point. And especially if you've played something like Quake or Counter-Strike, mm. I mean, it doesn't take very long playing it before you even almost don't see that anymore. You just yeah. see, right, oh, he's running here and I've got to go and attack. It, that's where it's, it, I see what you mean. It's It can be tough to sort of immerse people into that world because once you get through there, it's it seems so obvious. Yeah, and you know, Guardian's not buying um, buying an orc because he likes the sound it makes or the way it looks. <laughs> it's, it's just it's part of the strategy, isn't it? It's, yes. it's um, 
it's not about the guns, the graphics, or what they represent. It, it's just what they do in the game. <laughs> that that's all that matters at this level. And yeah, it, it, you're right. And I, I kind of you see this all the time, though. It's it's a fact of life, isn't it? When when we're trying to talk to the mainstream and build an audience uh, and try and tell this story, you're right. It, it, it kind of feels the wrong way to to talk about this game looks good look at these flashy graphics look at look at these amazing guns and so on but but i mean it is a tricky sell to get new people into a game and, and that is kind of the bottom rung of the ladder of yes. which esports might be the top yes. y you kind of have to make compromises at some point though i think unfortunately well, one of the things actually that I thought would be an interesting topic, like as we're rounding out the discussion here, is part of the reason why these things are so tricky is because if you notice the way we're framing it, it's because the idea is, right, okay, we've got this like bubble of esports and we want to mm. make the bubble get a bit bigger. So obviously everyone who's not in the bubble, they don't know what life's like in here. So we're trying to constantly like convince them to come in or tell them like, hey, it's really cool in there. You know, like mm. maybe you're into it or if you're not into it, don't worry, everyone else is. So you should at least be aware of it, you know. Mm. But that's always been one of the interesting things about the growth of esports because it also does that definitely have organic growth. You know, it grows from the gamers and it grows from the people who are super into it. And then, you know, on a more peripheral level, a casual players, but are aware of it, you know. And these people, you kind of don't have to sell them on it, right? They already get that it, it's cool. So that's one of the things I, I definitely, that's why I, I don't always. Like as much as I can be cynical about the commercial aspects, one thing that kind of makes me think it'll work out is as we go on and on and on, the future generations, it'll just be their world. You won't have to tell, like I don't have to convince some 10 year old cousin of why it would be cool if he ever played Counter-Strike to watch a tournament. He knows that like, yeah. what, there's a guy who's the best in the world and that he can win a million dollars. He's in already, you know, he's instantly in. It's the easiest uh, sell in the world. Well, can, can I ask you like, what? Do you, do you think do you think um, we can make an esports audience without them playing the game? Can you get somebody to watch esports without being a player? Because I, I, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, what do you think? I think it's a tough one. I think first of all, <laughs> I think it definitely depends what the game is. You yeah. know, like you've definitely. Like, I mean, this is one of the reasons why it's kind of a shame that Quake and Counter-Strike were the first ones and then got superseded because they were clearly the easiest to draw someone in. You know, hey, he's got mm -hmm. a gun, he's shooting at him, he has to run. He, you know, like something like League of Legends, I can tell you myself, I came over to League of Legends from Counter-Strike and StarCraft and, and it took a long time and, and, and playing was definitely a part of it before I could get a lot of the kind of basics to really appreciate the game. You know, I was watching it and I was thinking, come on, I've got all this competitive mm -hmm. experience. I must be able to figure this out. But... A lot of it wasn't intuitive in the way that, you know, an FPS game is because, you yeah. know, I mean, this is all, I've always thought this is one of the flaws. The graphics in some of these games don't necessarily correspond with what you're doing. Like, yeah. you don't know how powerful that blast he just did on him or the heal did, you know, it can be tough to translate those things, right? Yeah, because in, in a real sport, which, you know, you can watch and appreciate without playing it, it it's intuitive because it's people doing it. And you know yes. what? Running that fast is hard. I know that without having to try it myself and, and kicking that ball so accurately is difficult to do. Um, yeah, and you're right. In in Quake sort of probably was the simplest one to understand because it's like just one guy and another guy and it's like uh, head to head, you know, a duel in, in Quake I think is pretty straightforward. But yeah. you know what? That didn't turn out to be the best eSport, funnily enough. And, and Counter-Strike is, I think, harder to grasp but still, you know, it's like, okay, we understand SWAT. We understand, um, you know, this idea of trying to breach a, a point and, and so on. But yeah, once, once you get to, to MOBAs where you've completely detached from, from the actions of someone being this sort of first person view and, and so on, it's, it's tough. And I think, I actually think this is one of the biggest challenges now. Um, you know, growing up in esports before non FPS games were, well, okay, StarCraft, but but in my world, non-FPS games weren't a big deal. Um, th this is this is going to be the biggest challenge, I think. Yeah. Well, here's the thing, actually. I was thinking about it there while you were answering, hmm. right? This might sound like a cop-out because basically, I, 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 I don't know if you can grow as in like, like 
artificially create a new audience like the people who don't already play can you get them to watch hmm. at, a, at a small level maybe not because as we see they're still going with the angle at the moment of like hey this is a crazy new thing and you know mm, maybe you want to check it out and i imagine most people who read that article in whatever the guardian financial times they probably just do it for the little weird oh this is a interesting and then they turn the page and you know they never look into it you know it's just a thrill in in the time it takes to read the piece yeah. but i will say if it could ever breach a certain threshold the reason why i think you could get people who don't watch the game to do it is because i always used to think american football was a terrible sport because i come <laughs> from england where again football itself in england it's, it's very intuitive you know you just have a ball you can yeah. get it round it, you, you win if you score the goal like there's not really that many complicated rules. I know as much as people make jokes about like women not understand the offside rule <laughs> it, you don't have to, to appreciate football you know you could get away without knowing a simple rule like that yep. well the difference is the first few times I watched the NFL I was like I might just quit this because like I don't know what's going on here like what, what how many downs do they get and what's why is that a foul you know it's it, it, a lot of arbitrary rules but I'll say this one of the reasons I actually did start to watch it sometimes is because things like the Super Bowl became a cultural phenomenon. Mm. And so, I I mean, it's very famous now. I mean, it, funnily enough, I've heard that actually in, in like, fe female culture, one of the reasons they watch the Super Bowl is because of all the adverts in the halftime. Where that's, like, <laughs> that's a cultural thing, right? Everyone has to, did you see it? And what did yeah. you think of this one, you know? And so I, I, if, I, if I try to translate that to our culture in the UK... It was kind of similar when England matches were on, you know. You'd see a lot of people's wives and girlfriends would watch the match. And mm. I don't know that they were actually football fans. Some of them probably never watched a game. But they knew it was England playing. They knew that everyone else is super excited and everyone in the room's watching it. And so that's that's one way to tie back into what you said before. I think that's one way you can sell them on it. Like, yeah. it's going to be hard to explain to someone why it's cool to watch a League of Legends team fight. But if I told you some of the storyline of, like, who Faker is and that mm. this guy is, like... He's kind of like Jesus of League of Legends, you know, he like transcends the game and he's even better than all the people where he came from and he defies all the different eras and meta changes. And if you knew his story of like, you know, you had to battle through this and then join it, the, that that angle could draw you in, right? That kind of narrative part oh, could, yeah. could get you at least, it could at least maybe get you in the door to give it a try. Absolutely. That that personal angle is is the most compelling one because it's, it's the human angle. And it is these, um, these landmark events like uh the when the international breaks a certain That's a ridiculous good example, yeah yeah prize fund you know all of a sudden it's in the mainstream media saying 25 million dollar prize fund for a video game and you know people's ears prick up and then i, I imagine you know we we've had so many generations of of video game players and people who have that latent <laughs> love of video games who maybe just will tune in see what it's about and be like yeah i appreciate these guys who are skillful in video games that's, that's something i want to watch so yeah i think i think these um these uh what uh, what you call them like special events these big deals sudden like headlines they're they're the ones that are going to draw people in and yeah i just think it, it's probably you know the the softest landing is not necessarily the MOBA games, but um, but yeah, there there there's lots of esports going around, I suppose now to, to get into. Thing is, though, the fact that you would even ask that question just shows how different the mentality of some of us who were there from the beginning was. Because <laughs> everyone else would just say this: they'd say, "How do we make esports big?" And that in itself is like that's a pretty loaded question. That implies like <laughs> it can get big. Maybe it should, uh, you know, well, let's do whatever it takes, you know, whereas I have to say one thing that's made me, I mean, I think people just think I'm a miserable bastard when I say this, mm. but I've sometimes said, does it have to get bigger? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Like, does it have to go beyond a certain point? Can it just, can it just, like, for example, I've sometimes <laughs> said this to people because outside of the UK, they don't always appreciate like niche sports, you know, they'll just yeah. watch NFL or NBA. I often tell people. I, as boring as it might sound, because again, it's a nerdy thing. I've, I always love to watch the snooker when it's the world championship. Now that is obviously an incredibly <laughs> niche sport, yeah. but it has all professional scene. It has a television broadcast. The top players do make a good living. You know, there, it has its own history, but it's never going to be football it, it, and it doesn't even aspire to be. So mm. and, and I, could, I guess to tie it into the themes before, for me, it's like, unless... Unless we can do it in an authentic way that keeps the good parts of esports, yeah. I would I would just say no. We don't have to. You don't have to sell out basically, unless it kind of makes sense and there's a momentum. Just kind of I kind of let it let it go with the flow in a sense. Yeah, 
but I, I would I would defend growth at this stage still, even though it's we're huge right now and um, still growing. Obviously, <laughs> you know I, I've been working on these figures. And you, you look at the compound annual growth rate, and it's ridiculous, uh, and it looks like it's going to continue growing. But you know what I like about esports growing is that I I do feel like I'm part of this uh generation or this this group of of people who um let's say are not you know can be introverted can find uh escapism in video games and i I don't think that's a terrible thing like i i recognize that in myself and i recognize that in a lot of people i hang out with in video games it's not always true of course it's it's certainly it is a stereotype but i like that there's this outlet and I'm not the biggest fan of sports and I I think uh, I get a bit annoyed that certain sport people get all the credit that this guy who runs fast is suddenly the big star and selling stuff on TV and it's like man you just run it's definitely more impressive to be the best (laughs) quake player than 100 meter runner you know yes I mean obviously I'm completely biased but absolutely yeah dude you run like that's not useful to me unless I'm trying to catch a bus you know it's it's when is that useful whereas being great at a video game that that's useful that's like life skills <laughs> that's you know if i was going to employ someone and it was between a guy who runs faster a guy who's brilliant at video games it's still a bit tricky because the guy who's brilliant at video games might not be great in the office i'm just kidding it'd be the guy it'd be the guy who's good at video games he's demonstrated certain life skills that are valuable in in being an employee in in getting work done and prioritizing and strategizing um and these days because it's it's always teams it's it's teamwork you know communication leadership and so on um yeah it's <laughs> i i know i'm i i am probably not the person to ask but i i'd like to celebrate more of esports more i'd like the best gamers to be the you know, uh, put on a pedestal and and be the the, the role models that, that everyone looks up to rather than sports stars. Um, but another thing, um, so going back as well to the, the thing I liked about Quake, which we don't have anymore, is that it was 1v1. And there are so, one, so few 1v1 esports yes. any, anymore. And the thing about 1v1 esports is, there's a much stronger narrative you can tell with that, which is this guy versus this guy. It's a, it's a one personality versus another personality. And when you've got five people on a team, you kind of have this mesh of personalities. Yes. And this team has an identity, but it's not quite as strong as this single person. Um, back in our day, uh, my day, sorry, you're, you're still relevant. <laughs> You'd be Machiavelli versus Fatality, right? Fatality, the poster boy, he's always yes. precise, always efficient, always doing everything exactly right. Machiavelli's this uh, brash guy who throws chairs around when he loses, but he comes out with brilliance, unexpected yes. brilliance. And that's an exciting story. And you don't need to know what game they're playing or to understand the game to, to get that story. And that, that could grip you and bring you in. I mean, when you were saying there, though, about like elevating the players, etc., mm. like one of the interesting things, like I've, I've kind of alluded to before, as esports has gotten bigger, is sometimes it's areas of the industry grow that you don't see on camera. So, for example, like in Counter-Strike over the last four or five years, there were periods where the prize money was the same as the prize money was 15 years ago. Mm. So it looked like ours, it really got much bigger, but it did if you looked like, you know, the hotel you stay in, where the venue it is. So one area that I have to say was kind of like a, 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 a I'm trying to think what you'd call it, like a key moment for me, I guess, hmm. was when, when we had last year's Esports Industry Awards, because, I mean, you were there, obviously we were at yeah. the same table. That was like, that really was like the BAFTAs or something. Like the scale <laughs> of it was ridiculous. I thought, I didn't think it would look that big. And obviously they had like, people presenting it and stuff who were like you you were the sort of person who does any job on tv basically you know like they that would be the guy you'd see on some sort of an awards show or something it, it, mm-hmm. it felt real basically sue joy it didn't feel like we were pretending anymore yeah yeah um yeah uh and in a way this is this is all the ancillary stuff that you almost say the vultures that circle around when when there's a kill right yes. <laughs> and and it and it demonstrates and, and that's the thing i think in the early days, 
it grew like a bubble very quickly. Um, so none of this extra stuff happened. It was really just the prize money growing and all of a yes. sudden a few people doing really well, but without the support infrastructure of it all, which, you know, you see today. And I guess that's that's a good sign for the industry that these things are happening, that, that somebody thinks it's worthwhile to have an esports industry awards and make it. It's great big black tie event and people paying thousands of pounds to get a table at, at these events and so on. Um, yeah, it's it is nice to 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 have a, a room full of um, dinner jackets all celebrating which esports event was the coolest one this year. <laughs> so I actually um, like in, in I know in Quake this was the case, but especially in Counter Strike because obviously Counter Strike competitively lasted a long, long time. In fact, with CS:GO, it's it's transition, it's still around. Mm. We always used to have a saying that like no one quits one of these games. Like if you play it, the reason you can't quit is like, you can, obviously you can say I'm retiring or if you're a pro player, you say, oh, I've left my last team. I don't think I'm going to come back. But the point is, if you've put that much time into it, it, it was a fixture in your life. Mm -hmm. Even if you do go away, you're going to at least pop your head back in. You're going to come and try and play a little bit more. Are you going to find someone you used to, oh, yeah, come on, let's go on again. And it's going to, it's going to draw you back in at least temporarily. So obviously in your career in esports, this has happened. You know, there's been times when it maybe didn't make sense to work in that area anymore and you were in and then you were out for a while. It seems like you always get drawn back. Yeah. I think that'll always be the case. Uh, yes. Yes and no. Right. And, and I'll say why. Because so so Quake 1 was my game. Right. That was the one I suddenly just fell in love with and just played all the time till I won it till I was the best in the world in my mind. Arguable, of course. Um, and I came back for Quake 3, but all of a sudden there's these tournaments. So of course I'm coming back because that's it's like all of a sudden being good at a game can actually make you money. Definitely didn't make any money from Quake 1. Uh, I came back for Quake 4 because we've got these amazing events on. Um, and I was still decent, but I was running other businesses at the time, so I couldn't put in the same time. And... Um, let's say most recently Quake Champions, which came out, what was it last year, the year before? Yeah, I think last year. Yeah. Um, I didn't actually go to the tournaments. I mean, I could have, but I just, I just didn't have the time to put, uh, you know, to put in hours and to be of a standard where I thought I'd do myself justice. I wasn't going to be as good as the top players. Um, but I've still got an ego. That's the thing you, you'll, you'll find in pro gamers no matter what they do, no matter how much they try and um, act humbly, they, they've all got huge egos. We've all got huge egos. And um, it's hard to go in for me to play a Quake game and be bad at it now. <laughs> I'd, I'd hate it. Um, it, it, it. you kind of living up to this old image of yourself. And, and it's hard. Uh, <laughs> this is what, when I went to play Quake Champions, I just... I, I just hated being bad at it and I didn't have the time to be good at it. And all pro gamers have this huge ego where they hate to be bad at a game that they've been known for. It, it's just this image of myself that I have that I, I don't want to let down. Um, and yeah, I just, I, I wouldn't want to be bad at a Quake game now. Um, so, so that makes it hard to go back unless I put in the time and be great at it again. Do you get any kind of, like, can you in some way live vicariously from the jobs you've done in esports? Do you still get any kind of connection in that sense from it? Oh, absolutely. I I, I definitely still like being in the scene. Um, and I was big into Dota, or oh, I still am, um, for the last few years. So um, I don't know if you're aware of it. There was um, a hub, an EU hub in... Uh, what was it three, four years ago now at, at Two Goods House, where okay. he just brought a whole bunch of yeah, people. Yeah, good studio, right? Yeah, yeah. So this was the TI4 hub, and right. it was just a case of bringing loads of personalities and players and broadcasters into a house where it was like a Big Brother stream. So it'd be 24-hour broadcast on Twitch yes. um, with cameras around the house and people watching the games. And at this point, this was the qualifiers leading up to TI4. So wasn't the most important games in the world, but it, it had, there was an opportunity there to take a breath before the actual final happened. And we just had so much fun. And I, I loved 
being there and and for me i had this story of look i come from the the, the original days of of pro gaming so you know i get to tell those stories again and and tell talk to people about how we've gone from from where we where we were to where we are now and you know i love being in the scene i i love being this sort of <laughs> elder statesman of of pro gaming um and you know the most fun i have is is still going to events that's why i'm always at uh, the dota events well, I mean, to, to come full circle, when you said at the beginning, when you were first doing the first media stuff, and obviously they treated it like a novelty thing, sometimes just like a joke, you know, as a way of like poking fun at something. Mm. The difference is you can tell the same stories from back then now. And if it's to someone who's actually in esports, they think that's cool. They're like, oh, what was it like? And oh, it was all this. And they don't realize that. Obviously, we're, we're remembering half of it through roast in classes, yeah, you know, well, it wasn't as glamorous <laughs> as we remember, but it felt awesome. Yeah, yeah, I think so. But uh, and at the same time, there's nothing like going into a stadium and hearing the crowd roar for esports, and that's something we never got <laughs> uh, in the early days. So, so yeah, it, it, yeah, it's it's this spine tingling moments you get from from the growth that you see today. Um, but yeah, I, I'd like to think the history is important because this is still a young. A young industry and it's good to remember that it's good to remember that we we've, we've come like so far in such a short amount of time that we shouldn't just stop here and like we, we should be innovating we should be figuring out what's next and not settling on a certain way of doing things we should be trying ideas um you know that uh, i i just really hate if we just became stagnant now um because i i think the best is yet to come right do you have anyone you want to thank or say hello to at the end of this interview? <laughs> um, well, I mean, uh, it's good to talk to you again, Duncan. <laughs> it's been a while. Yes, yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I was sort of out of esports for a little while doing my own thing. And all of a sudden it exploded without me being there. So <laughs> I didn't, uh, I can't t claim credit for, for the, the big explosion in esports. But I think I go back to events now and I see so many people who believed that this could happen one day there. And, I, and you know, it's just like you don't even have to say anything. You sort of see each other at events and it's like this nice moment of, yeah, we made it. And I see I see you and I see I see Richard Lewis. Um, you know, you see you see Carmack, um, you know, even Ralph from ESL, who's, who's just worked so long to, to take ESL to where it is today who still loves watching his games, you know, sits in the, in the, uh, in the stands whenever he can to watch what's happening. You see all these people who, who've been in there and always believed it. And it's just this wonderful thing to see it, it, esports be what it is today. Um, and yeah, I, I just, every time I, I go to an event and see these guys, it's, it's a really happy moment for me. This is PPD. You guys are watching Thorne's YouTube channel. One of the only men with a bigger ego than even myself. This video was made possible by Dean Tanglis, Sanity, G-Man, Andreas Snazor Westerland, Alex Adams, Mikkel Hansen, Jerky's Minion, Anthony, Bash, Daniel Yordanov, Jordan Senkov, TTMXMP, Vexi, Horpt, Travis Tigreb. Just like my man, a lot of people think you can't tell me nothing. But I've graduated from that mindset, and now it is possible to have influence over some of the people I have on my show, some of the topics I cover, to ask me questions directly, and get exclusive teasers for upcoming projects I'm working on. Unlock the code to the streets, and join the Skrilluminati today at the Patreon link below.